I've, I've entitled this, uh, uh, and I think it is and just in the spirit of this society, I, I think I have this unique opportunity to have lived in both the worlds that are here today. And this is my, and I entitled this my personal journey of discovery and reflection. So I'm a first generation immigrant uh, to the United States of America. There are, all of us live in two worlds, one by birth, and in my case, one by a warm embrace. And all of us these days are looking back at our past of who we are and where we came from. And I put up this very interesting slide, which is not mine, but that of a cousin of mine who decided to delve into the history of the city that I was born and lived most of my life in, uh, the city of Delhi. The city of Delhi was originally called Shah Jahanabad, the home of Shah Jahan. The so Shah Jahan was the Mughal emperor who was the richest man, man in planet Earth in his time, and he laid the foundation stone for this well-planned city. Among his advisors was the family forefather, and, and this cousin of mine has delved into this and pointed out that our family may have existed in this town for over 300 years. So I was born, lived through, and Delhi was in my roots and in my soul. And while I traveled as a military brat in different places, and I came back always to Delhi. And I came back and went into medicine. And the theme today, I think, is that I was able to stand on the shoulders of giants. And I want to share with you what these giants can do. Uh, the first giant who crossed my path was Sujoy Roy, who was head of cardiology at my old medical school. Sujoy had been brought back from the prestigious Thorndike Laboratory at Harvard, where he was a physiologist. And he came to India, found rheumatic fever was the prevailing, prevailing disease, and a war with China catapulted him into the field of high altitude circulatory physiology. He took a, he took a striving second year medical student and showed him the wonders of the human's physiology and circulatory physiology. And he took me on a, on, a, on a project looking at ventricular dysfunction and physical work capacity in the Himalayas. At that time, a love affair with research and investigation was born for me. And he encouraged me to pursue research in the United States. When I arrived here, I went through the usual story of training and, and, and going through the steps of achieving specialty training, and eventually ended up in electrophysiology, and I'll talk a moment about it. But the journey of non-pharmacologic therapy of tachycardias really commences in the 60s, where there was the decade, which I call the decade of electrocardiographers, and cardiac pacing, which was before my time. I did not even know that this existed. The 70s were the decade of the birth of this field. And the surgeons and the first clinical EPs emerged as the champions of this field. I joined this field in the mid 70s and see them. And the foundational decade for non-pharmacologic therapy was really the 80s. When I started in this field in 1980, single chamber cardiac pacing was just being adopted. A dual chamber pacemaker was experimental. Electrocardiography and empiric pharmacotherapy dominated this field. Books on frontiers in this field, such as the one I show on the right from the Mauricio Rosenbaum did not even mention devices or ablation. But again, when I came here, I had the chance once again to stand on the shoulders of giants. Tino Castellanos, Augustine Castellanos that we honored yet last year at HRS and Robert Marber, who is with us till today, uh, and, uh, recruited me to their, to their uh, department in Miami. 
Castellanos and Myra were two different people coming from different worlds. Castellanos was interested in physiology. He described a lot of the maneuvers we do in SVT and WPW. He had just developed with Ber Berkowitz the implantable demand single chamber pacemaker. And then before I arrived the dual chamber pacemaker. Meyerberg came from a different school. He was a basic scientist looking at bundle branch block and activation of the left bundle and the right bundle. You remember him best now for his pyramid, the sudden death pyramid where he was a premier epidemiologist in the field of sudden death at the same time, wore two very different hats. And, when, and here I come wanting to do circulatory physiology and in a concession to my desires, they give me my first research project, regional wall motion and left bundle branch block. But after one year, nobody was interested and I threw in the towel and I joined the electrophysiologist. In my last few months, two very seminal things happened. Rui Sang working there in, uh, in the university laboratories with, with Castellanos discovered that the slow pathway was, was anatomically in a different location than the fast pathway. This paper was not accepted. There were tremendous criticisms of Rui, even suggesting that he had marked up the tracings. Eventually, we prevailed. At the same time, a movie came to Meyerberg to be shown on the to topic of sudden cardiac death. And he shared it with us, concerned that it would upset the animal rights activists. It was the famous dog movie of defibrillation where Mirowski demonstrated defibrillation in an animal. These two left a great impression on me. I tried to return to India, but EP was not to be and I came back. And in that time, I crossed the third giant set of giants. Michelle Mirowski, who had developed the implantable defibrillator generator, and his good friend and my good friend, Gerard Girardon, who had pioneered the first ablative surgery, the VT ablation with a surgical substrate isolation therapy. And through them, I met Guy Fontaine, who inadvertently ablated the His bundle with a direct current shock delivery. So I was recruited by a cardiac surgeon who gave me the charge to start surgical ablation. In 1980, the program started at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center that was funded by cardiac surgery. That's an important fact I'll come back to. So my first charge was to develop surgical ablations and we had no equipment. There is no trained staff, there is no dedicated laboratory, but there is great enthusiasm. And there comes the first principle that the enthusiasm of the coworkers electrophysiologists, surgeons, biomedical engineers work together. And we actually did our first VT ablation with our own manufactured equipment in one, a year later. I went in search of some money and the American Heart Association gave us a little bit of money to start a basic lab, a fellowship started. But probably the most important thing that happened in 1981 was I become an ASCII member. New York City holds the annual scientific sessions that year. And I discovered I'm no longer alone and isolated. I really find my second home. Over the next few years, we acquire technologies, laser electrical ablation, DFIP technologies. And we do something that is un incredible for even for me now to think about it. I get my own IDE without a sponsor with the FDA for catheter ablation. We maintain this IDE, we learn how to run an IDE. And here, are, here is equipment that you will find laughable. The first epicardial VT mapping plaques made in epoxy embedded stainless steel wires, a ribbon electrode for WPW mapping in the operating room. And then the engineers developed slightly better versions of them a little later. Catheters for ablation that were homemade that we, that we developed with, with our own available tools. 
both for RF and for laser ablation. But we, we went in search of the science here and we studied physiology in animal and human tissues. We dissected human VT substrates and found willing students to work with us. The behavior of drugs and ablative energies was modified or attenuated in human disease ventricle was a lesson from those studies. We went into whole animal studies and developing technology. And one day, an engineer by the name of Peter Osipka walked into my office and off offered me the possibility to trial the first dedicated radio frequency gen generator. Osipka Enterprises today is a multinational conglomerate. And here are the early studies that we did to try and figure out how to do an ablation. But we learned other lessons. We learned the facts of life in the 80s. That was no money for electrophysiology. We also learned the lesson of strength in numbers. So the funding of, from cardiac surgery was only for a time period. I went on a supplicating visit to Blue Cross Blue Shield down in Southern New Jersey for a temporary EP code. There was no federal reimbursement for EP studies. We started doing cardiac cath to pay the side. We get so good at it that we eventually, I ran the laboratory, but we, we learned to do a lot of cardiac cath at that time. We got a foundation to fund our EP lab. And in desperation, we, f we started our own research foundation. In 1983, the EP Research Foundation was established. My administrator, who later became my life partner, was tired of losing money on our, our cost center. And she researched and published the first cost effect of the studies in electrophysiology. And I show you the figure from that, showing the cost effectiveness of EP guided treatment before and after an EP evaluation that was published. We suddenly got CPT codes. We then attacked the underpayment of hospitals. We got new DRGs. With this effort, I got drafted to manage the NASP effort in getting new CPT codes. And that evolved further. Seymour Furman had been defending cardiac poisoning from onerous government investigations. And he was tired. He withdrew from that activity. I got drafted and we have, we developed a health policy committee, which exists till today. We learned this lesson of strength in numbers because we were then able to get clinical electrophysiology funded. We all, and I want, one of the themes in this little discussion is going to be that we made pivotal but observational inferences. We did studies in defibrillation and discovered the need for a left-sided electrode, which eventually evolved into a implant, which was successful. And we also developed catheter ablation in the operating room. And I show you the example of the picture of the first patient, which actually hung in Epcot Center for a while. And patient number five, whose VT, the warm beating heart, was ablated and terminated. In 2019, I, have, I saw this patient last. He was alive and well after laser VT ablation with no VT recurrences, and his heart failure had been treated with a CRT device. We developed a name, a field, by the, we had the first books that defined our discipline. But we also encountered a backlash, which we don't talk about a lot now. The clinical studies received no, local and national attention there was concern that this was experimental work on human beings, that defibrillation was painful and almost a, barba a barbaric therapy for awake patients. I was compelled to do co closed heart ablations because there was a discussion that endocardial ablation involves mechanical entry, surgical yeah. entry into the, into the endocardium. And for defibrillation, we did live satellite implants to prove the fact that it was, it was really possible. We did that implant in 1987. 
And there is an interesting fact about that case report. 24 reviewers declined to review it. And I got an eight page critical review on that one case report. We also had the dubious honor of publishing the first ICD lead failure series in 1989. The first death was a physician and that's his x-ray on the right. But non-pharmacologic therapy at the end of 80s was here to stay. But it encountered its next great challenge. There were clashes of titans with NIH and big business. The foundation defended and obtained an ICD patent, but to the everlasting uh, respect for my trustees that they released it without enforcement and that every manufacturer could, could use it. Even the laser process uh, patent was re released. The first ICD policy conference took place in the beginning of the 90s and I invited Salim Yusuf for NIH by Yusuf came to the meeting and criticized the ICD observational data as not being credible. Three, four months later, I invited him to meet me in New York City. Over dinner, he agreed to fund an $8 million trial that became the AVID trial. But there was still skepticism and, and the head of the NIH council wanted to have somebody that he knew to run that trial and it started. In that trial, I requested an outcome analysis by ejection fraction strata based on our and Akhtar's observations. The request was shelved. And at the end of the trial, the NIH coordinating center refused to do the EF strata analysis as not having included in the statistical plan. An NIH intervention led to the analysis being done. At the same time, the backlash was on, as you see on the editorials on the right, as to why a clinical trial should ever be done. And you can see them and they are self-explanatory. This was the result of that subgroup analysis that is called post hoc, was excluded from the statistical uh, uh, plan. In a total surprise to all the planning committee members who believed that the ICD was a therapy for the young and healthy, it was the sick with heart failure who benefited. So there were always pearls to be found when observations are coupled with RCTs. And we come into the last part of the 90s we concentrate on building our identity, our community, and EP goes global. And once again, enthusiasm prevails. Andrea mentioned our restructuring of NASPI to HRS for this global purpose. We did that with McKinsey. And in 1998, as one of the first steps, we participated in a big way in the Sixth Asian Pacific Symposium led by Kamal Sethi. That evolved into starting an ICD project in India, ICDs at cost, an Indian office established by volunteers and a sudden cardiac death victim son. At the same time, HRS had get, got its definitive headquarters and Jerry Nacarelli presented me with a hard hat at, at that point. Uh, and the EPRF project ended in 2004 but I would be remiss if I didn't show you this piece of paper that I found in my records. This is an invoice for what industry did, what, what the foundation did. And you can see that here's a defibrillator and it's, and it's ancillary requirements sent to India for $5,500. The project ended in, 19, in 2004 and HRS at the same time moved to Washington DC with a new CEO and IHRS came into being. So my, my last few comments and my reflections on this journey, durable discoveries I believe come from understanding physiology, challenging conventional wisdom. In 1998, I gave this Magister lecture in Rome as AF and organized rhythm of biatrial origin. This was not well received. On the right, we, are, we can see it now in real time what happens in both sides. So there is no real enduring progress without knowing physiology and anatomy 
empiricism takes you only so far. You need to follow physiology to wherever it takes you in designing therapy. And observational data can still be the source of pivotal advances. This is an unchallenge that still lives with us. I was part of this planning committee of this trial. This trial threw the field into disarray. We believe sinus rhythm was better. It did not validate it. But we persisted. We have wondered for a long time as the token non-pharmacologic member on the planning committee, I have wondered on the results of this trial and looked at it all with everybody else. We discovered recently that the almost half of these patients had their first episode of heart failure during the trial. And it is the patients with rhythm control in whom heart failure emergence was delayed. What was not appreciated in this trial was that heart failure is the most common and important complication of atrial fibrillation, more than stroke and death. It was absent from its focus. And it is the first step towards that takes us to the next step, which is mortality. And we are now finally beginning to rethink the results of this trial. And one re rethink is right here, this trial you mentioned. And, and also atrial resynchronization that we mentioned. We are now intrigued that patients maintain rhythm control for 10 to 15 years after three device change outs. And we notice that atrial filling is improved. And we think there may be a role in heart failure. No journey is, is, is without the people who support you from this. Thing. And I, would, I, I have to thank the people who allowed me to participate, my late wife and my parents who allowed a son to go far away to learn what could be done. Finally, a few words of the future that DJ asked me to say, I think we have to understand normal physiology for critical therapy. We are understanding physiology and genetics like never before. I won't dwell on this, but targeted therapies by, built by technology is the future. And finally, gene-based interventions and their delivery, microRNA therapies, understanding why telomeres get us to age, all of these things are part of the future of medicine and we will be part of treating our diseases of aging. So let me conclude by saying that interventional electrophysiology is one of the most incredible stories of 21st century medicine. And I had a great pleasure of being part of a small part of that story. My thanks to my many coworkers and collaborators over four decades. Thank you for the honor that you have bestowed on me, and more importantly, for your collegiality, your friendship, and the support that lent us, saw us through all these journeys. Thank you very much.